this edition of Mac Voices could have been sponsored by you. Mac Voices is always looking for sponsors who appreciate our high signal, low noise approach to tech topics with an Apple focus. Our sponsorship packages feature inclusion in all of the audio and video versions of Mac Voices at all of their distribution points, a web presence, inclusion in the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, and more. Get the details by contacting me at chuck at macvoices.com or contact Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this time we're going to talk iOS 8 and Swift, uh, Apple's new programming language, with the guy who wrote the book on iOS programming, Mr. Matt Newberg. Matt, it's great to have you. Thanks for being back. Uh, great to be back. Great to be back. Yeah, we'd... We've talked many times about, about iOS in the past, and as you know, I'm the author of, of four editions of a programming iOS book for O'Reilly, and this is really, the change in language has come as a complete shock. <laughs> Did you remember, you remember WWDC and the keynote, and they sort of buried the lead. They talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And in the last 10 seconds, the guy says, and there's a whole new language you're going to be using. And that was the end of the keynote. And I'm sitting there going, what the heck <laughs> just happened? And ever since then, it's been scramble, scramble, scramble. And I was sitting in an auditorium with a room full of developers, and you could just hear the, the kind of collective gasp yeah. as to yeah. as to what? 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 Yeah. yeah. So. Well, it's not – this is the funny thing. It's not like – it's not a surprise in the sense that we all wanted this. I mean, this is what everyone has been saying is, you know, what we need here is a better language. The, the language that you use to program for iOS is Objective-C, which is a mixture of C, which is a really, really old language, um, um, a, a, a low-level, nitpicky, difficult, shoot-yourself-in-the-foot language. A mixture of C and a thing called small talk, which is a clever, um, dynamic, introspective, message-sending language that doesn't really fit in with C at all. And the result is this language which, although extremely powerful, it's very, very easy to shoot yourself in the foot, to, to, to go off the rails. And and a lot of people have been, you know, and, and that was fine in the days when the people who were programming um, uh, Coco were programmers, you know, computer science wackos or dedicated programmers. But when iOS came along, everybody and his brother wanted to write an iOS app. So all these people came into the, to the programming world that Apple sort of wasn't expecting. And they were making, um, they were making mistakes and having problems and misunderstandings that really were caused by the fact that the Objective C language was in their way. And so we were, you know, we were all saying we really need a modern language here, a better. But nobody thought Apple would actually ever do it. And it turned out that secretly there was this Skunk Works program. There was like one guy who'd come on board who'd been like looking at the situation and going, yeah, I think I can write a better language and been writing and writing and writing and writing and testing and testing and testing and testing. And several years down the road, he's like, I think we can start using this. And Apple said, OK. And so, you know, here we are. So on the one hand, it's fantastic because we needed a new language. But on the other hand, it means I've got to take all my existing code and translate it from Objective-C into Swift and see what the ins and outs of this new language are. And Apple is still working on Swift. The language changes every two weeks when they release a beta. So it's been, you may imagine, in trying to understand what my life has been like, that it's been very exciting and interesting and busy without let up since WWDC back in June to now, I mean, here we are in late August, and it's and we've had six revs of 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 um, of iOS eight and Swift, and Swift has been quite significantly different on every rev, and and I, I have to go back every time and rewrite everything again. It's been fun, it's been exciting, but it's been very busy. Matt, this this news of Swift burned really bright right after WWDC, and then it sort of faded back unless you're a, an Apple industry watcher and then you saw the, the information about the, the new betas come out and new releases and all. But I'm, I'm curious, 
from a developer standpoint, and, and I'm going to ask you to comment from the developer standpoint and also then what it means to the to the rest of us. Mm-hmm. But from a developer standpoint, how much rewriting, once you translate it into Swift, how much rewriting are you actually having to do is with, with each subsequent beta? Is it 5%, 20%, 50%? Well, you make it sound uh, – it's not a matter of percentage. It's that, if, it's that when they change the language, things that you said are no longer legal. So it's not like it's a lot of work. What happens is you open up your, your program, which you've rewritten from Objective-C to Swift. I mean, I could go back and describe what the, what the translation process is like, if you like. Um, it's not very difficult. Um, a machine could almost do it. Um, uh, you, could, you, could, you can translate Objective-C almost line by line into Swift. Now, the result is not very Swifty. Um, so, 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 yes, now you are speaking this other language, but you're not speaking it very idiomatically. So then you might make a second pass. And I'll illustrate this in a minute. I brought along some code to show. You might make a second pass where you go back and, and say, how can I do this in a way that takes advantage of some of the features of the Swift language that weren't present in the Objective-C language? How can I do this in a Swiftier way? But that's not the, – the, the thing you asked about is what's been happening um, because of these re-releases. What happens is you open the thing and try to compile it, and it doesn't compile. See, it used to compile and it didn't, and now it doesn't. But that's okay because the way that it works is the compiler says that line is illegal. In fact, sometimes it says that line is now illegal. You used to be able to do that, but you can't. In other words, they wrote the compiler error message in a way that helps you and says, you know, before you were able to say, I'll give an example. Um, um, it used to be legal to ask whether something was nil, which means it has no value, by saying, if the thing is called X, you could say, if X. And this was something that they had brought over from C and Objective-C. Well, during the period you were talking about, right after the language was released, there was a lot of argument about that. Over on the, on the dev forums and on people's blogs and things like that, people were saying, this is not a smart move. Because, because basically, you're asking the language to be a smart ass. I mean, if should mean true and false, not nil or not nil. And the fact that it can mean both nil or, and not nil and true or false is confusing. Because what if it's not nil, but it's false? Or what if it's, what if it's, what if it's nil, but if it wasn't nil, it would be, you know, a Boolean true. I mean, it's too confusing. So they wisely got rid of that. And they said, okay, from now on, if you want to know whether something is nil, you have to say, does it equal nil? Well, that's very, very sensible. But of course, if you'd written code that relied on that feature, which you probably did, all of that code broke. But it didn't, broke in a, it didn't break in a difficult way. You just looked at all the error messages. You found all those lines. The thing was pointing right at them, and you fixed those lines. Everything was fine. So for the most part, for the most part, these changes have been very easy to fix. Now, some of the changes in the language have been, uh, they've been subtle, or I shouldn't say subtle. They've been, they've been surprising to some people in a way that caused some, some complaint, wrongly, I think. Um, I won't get into the details except to say, Swift is a good language in part because it tries to save the programmer from making certain kinds of elementary mistake. And a typical example of an elementary mistake is, I'm going to get technical, but what can I do? You have an object, and this object has what's called instance variables. And when the object comes into existence, which is called instantiation, those instance variables need values. Now, in Objective-C, those instance variables might be given fake values. And that was bad because there was no error, but those fake values were not useful either. And so you would try to refer to those fake values and you wouldn't have any trouble. You wouldn't crash or anything like that. But you get nonsense because you had forgotten to give them real values. That was something you had to do. 
Now, Swift prevents you from doing this. Swift says, no, you've got to cover your basis. So you cannot hand me an object that has instance variables that need real values and not give them real values. That simply, that won't even compile. So, so there were these clever features built into the language to save you from making certain kinds of mistake that often led to trouble down the road. As time went on, they closed more and more of these loopholes, making the programmer do more and more work up front to make sure that everything was okay or the program wouldn't compile. And some people complained about that because they said, oh, now I've got to go all the way back. I've got to go through my, my program, fix every one of these compiler errors. But to me, it's Swift saving the programmer from himself. I think what we're going to see is much more robust programs. I think, I, I think the vast majority of the sources of error on places like Stack Overflow, where you see people saying, oh, I did this and this, and I'm getting nonsense, and same answer over and over again. You forgot to instantiate this instance variable. Well, that's never going to happen again. You can't forget. So a lot of what's happened is they've refined and refined and refined. They've made Swift even swiftier. And I think I think the result is, is, is generally good. Now, do I think Swift is a perfect language? Well, it's a good language in, in, um, in the abstract, but it is not a perfect language for talking to iOS to, because back behind the scenes, iOS is still Objective-C and some of iOS is C. So there are places where you need to use Swift to talk to C. You're not talking C, but you're talking to C. And it can't do that perfectly. There are things it cannot say. And that is a, it's a flaw. It's a serious flaw. So no, it's not perfect. And there are times when you still actually need Objective C to say what you need to say in order to get something done. Because the receiving thing, iOS in the back, needs to be spoken to a certain way, and you can't speak that way in Swift. That's just the price of, it's the price of glory. Every once in a while, you're going to come to one of those situations, and you have to sort of talk your way out of it by continuing to use Objective-C. So that's the situation that we're in. But I think it's a good situation. I think it'll make um, the programmers of iOS better programmers. Now, you asked a minute ago, does this mean anything for us? Yes. Yes. I think there'll be fewer errors and fewer crashes. Um, you know, people, people can write careless code that, that, you know, they don't discover that a situation can arise where they've forgotten to instantiate a thing they need to instantiate and they get nonsense later. Or they can, they can, they can, cause a, a, a mismanagement of, of memory or something like that. So they release an app into the wild, and there's a crash because there's a circumstance they never thought to test. I think there's going to be fewer of those because Swift is going to save people from those kinds of mistakes. So yeah, I think, I think there will be a difference. There will be a difference. Okay, a couple follow-up questions. First of all, when you say that you sometimes have to go fall back and rely on Objective-C, mm. I would assume that that's a temporary thing because Apple was going to want a complete solution and it's just a matter of more iterations of Swift being released before it does that. Maybe, but I don't think that's going to happen before Swift 1. In other words, in other words next month or the, or the month after, iOS 8 is going to go final, Swift 1 is going to go final. I don't think those problems, I'm just guessing, but I don't think those problems are going to be fixed then. I mean, I can already see the light in Apple's eyes for Swift 2. Now that they've gotten all this feedback, see, you think things have been really quiet, but since, since the big foo for all right at the start, but actually there's been a lot of back and forth with developers. I mean, I've written like a bug report a day saying, you know, it, we're not interfacing correctly with this or that in Swift. You know, Swift doesn't understand this, Swift doesn't understand that. And some of those things have been fixed, so I know Apple's paying attention. So I think there'll be much more of that, but it's not all going to happen at once. They know perfectly well that real artists ship and they're going to ship this. So for right now, there will still be situations where your program could be written partly in, in, in Swift and partly, a little tiny part, in Objective-C. Would you like to see some code? 
Yeah, I, I'd love to. One one more thing, though, I'd like for you oh. to, to clarify for me. Um, somewhere in that conversation, you said that we can expect to see more robust programs. Define robust for us, it is because I, I don't know what a robust program is. Are you talking about sophisticated programs, stable programs, both? I think I just mean um, uh, less likely to crash unexpectedly or less likely to wind up in a situation where you tap a button and nothing happens. See, in Objective-C, these fake values, let's say it's a nil value. Um, you can get a nil value that you weren't expecting to get. And in Objective-C, if you send a message to a nil value, nothing happens. So that's good because you didn't crash. But it's bad because nothing happened. Got it. In Swift, that is impossible. Okay, In Swift, if you believe something is... Um, if you believe something is not nil, and it is nil, you will crash. That is good, because that means that the programmer will discover this situation early on. Also, the language is written in such a way that if something can be nil, but the programmer does not act like it can be nil, the program won't compile. In other words, you have to, be, you have to admit that it could be nil. You have to take that into account in the way you structure the program. So... The language itself makes you more cognizant of that kind of thing. Makes sense. Okay. Let's see some code. Okay, I'll show you some. You should be seeing two versions of the same code. On top is uh, Objective-C code, and on the bottom is an equivalent in Swift. And I'll point out some differences. They're going to be stupid, boring differences. You yeah, just have to accept that, okay? This is nerdy crap. But, you know, you want to know what is all the fuss about. Okay? What's the first thing you notice about the stuff on the top? Every line ends with a semicolon. And if you forget the semicolon, the compiler gets all unhappy. It's like, in Swift, no semicolons. It's like, hooray, we're freed from the tyranny of the semicolon. All right, here's another example. In, in, in Objective-C, on top, you must announce what everything is. So in order to create this thing called image that's going to be a UI image, I have to say it's a UI image. In Objective-C, down at the bottom, that's not true. It knows it's going to be an image because... The thing that I'm doing here is a thing that makes an image. So we know darn well it's going to be an image, so there's no need to explain that to the compiler. All right, here are some more subtle points. Names are shorter. So look at this name on top. The resizing mode is called UI image resizing mode stretch. Now look at the equivalent on the bottom. It's called stretch. Same thing here. UI con UI control state normal on the top. On the bottom, same thing, normal. UI bar metrics default on the bottom, default. So it's a less verbose language. Also, we don't have these square brackets every place. Everything in Objective-C is between square brackets. But in, well, not every, well, almost everything, unless it's pure C. But in Swift, everything happens between um, either parentheses or uh, curly braces, and you can chain them. So instead of a nest of brackets inside brackets inside brackets, you have command followed by command followed by command, and it's much more clear. So here... In that stretch of, of code, I'm doing several um, I'm doing several steps in order to wind up with this image image three. So I start with image, then I prepare myself to draw, then I draw image, that gives me image two. Then I take image two and I turn it into a resizable image. That gives me image three. I'm going clunkety, 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 clunk. Here, everything happens in order 
straightforward from top to bottom. So I say, I'm going to make an image. It's going to have a certain size. It's made out of this other image. I draw it. I turn it into a resizable image. I give it its insect and its in inset and its resizing mode. And you see, that was all one line, all one command that just generated that image. So that's the, it, I know it sounds very silly, but, but if you go back to the Objective C example, there were many places to go wrong. And I can't go wrong in, in any of those ways in, in Swift. I'll give you an example. A really bad thing to do would be to say, begin image context and forget to say, end image context. That's a real possibility in Objective-C. In Swift, I've written myself a utility function that says those two things for me. So when I call image from context of size, that's my function. It calls begin image context and end image context. I can't make a mistake. That's the kind of condensed thing that you're able to do. So those are some nerdy, yeah, those were nerdy examples. But I think that that, I think that gives you a sense, I think that gives you a sense of, of you know, why people are going to like this language better. It's not as clunky. It's easier to read. It's easier to write. There's not so much announcing what you're going to do. You just do it. Well, if it's easier to use, easier to, to read, easier to write, that means, first of all, fewer mistakes. It, it's also from my programming days way back when in languages that are probably quite dead by now. Just the fact that more things are built in, you don't have nearly as much Time, it, it doesn't chew up nearly as much time to compile or to run. So programs automatically get faster. Well, I don't know whether it'll be faster because the way that this works behind the scene is that Swift has to be turned into, um, it's got to be turned into C behind the scenes. Um, so so it, it's all going to depend upon the optimization of their compiler. But it's sure faster for the programmer to read and write because he doesn't spend so much time doing stupid stuff. I mean, think about the time that it takes to write the words UI image resizing mode stretch versus the time it takes to say stretch, you know, a long thing versus a short thing. The more things that can be short, the better. Here's how I think of it. The guy said to himself, this is my chance. I can put... See, there were things... You couldn't change anything about the Objective-C language. It's C, so you can't violate C. You can't get rid of the semicolons. The semicolons are part of C. You can't make an Objective-C language that doesn't have semicolons. It's C. C has semicolons. But now the guy is saying to himself, no, I'm going to put a whole new front end in front of this. So it's like, dream on. What would you like to do? Well, I'd like not to have any semicolons. Well, you can do that. And then I suppose behind the scenes, when the thing is compiled into C or Objective-C or whatever it's compiled into, he puts them back or whatever. I don't know what he's doing behind the scenes. And you don't care. And I don't care. That's right. That's right. That, so that I think that I think that explains about about Swift and the Swift language. Matt, how much um, how much are we seeing now with with Swift being implemented? And and I, and I'm, it seems like developers are always updating their apps. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I've every day I probably download eight updates uh, or more yep. if I, over a weekend. It's more, um, you know, to to my iOS apps. What's going on there? Is that part of this transition that people are integrating this into their existing programs? Or is that just normal iOS app maintenance that is necessary? It's, I don't think it's going to be um, linguistic because I don't think you can release a Swift app yet. So if you are seeing this stuff now, I think that's simply people either doing what's normal or getting ready. People can certainly start integrating iOS 8 features, they won't work on your device because you don't have iOS 8 installed yet. So I think, I think it's more likely to be 
right now, I think it's more likely to be people getting rid. See, you can't pass. I don't think you can pass a Swift app through the App Store. I don't think they're ready to accept that. So I don't think anything of what you're seeing has any has any Swift in it yet. Okay. But on, on the other hand, on the other hand, there are architectural changes coming down the road, and I can certainly see why people would want to get ready. Okay, and that that is going to be the follow up question: is right. that what you were saying? So. There could be features lurking in my app yet that just won't be turned on until we hit OIS, iOS 8? Right. Or they could be ways of doing stuff that people are like, you know, I may as well start doing it this way for iOS 8. Of course, we won't be in iOS 8, so that won't happen. But when iOS 8 comes online, so that may be some of it. Or it could just be normal maintenance. People, you know, it take, people constantly find bugs and they're doing normal maintenance. But let's use that as an excuse to talk about some of the things that are new in, in, in iOS 8. And again, I don't want to talk about new features, okay? I'm, you know, there was a, I, you go back to WWZC, there was a list of new features. There's health kit and there's, you know, there's this kit and that kit. I'm not interested in any of that. To me, all of that is stuff that's been glommed on. To me, the important thing is I've said to you on more than one occasion, what Apple needs to do is stop and rationalize, okay? And iOS has grown they made their first mistake the day they released the iPad. I mean, they 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 didn't think to themselves, you know, how are we going to make this fit with the iPhone world? Instead, they just created a bifurcated world. So there were certain things you could do on the iPad you couldn't do on the iPhone. There were certain things you would do on the iPhone you had to do them differently on the iPad. You had to have two sets of code. You had to have two sets of interface and they kept not bringing them back together. They kept not, they kept not, um, uh, they kept not rationalizing the mess that they'd made. They didn't stop and say, "Let's make sense out of this." Now they have. It's amazing. There's just so many features, basic features. Um, I'll give you two examples. One is the simple matter of what happens when you rotate the device. When you rotate the device, the app rotates. I mean, you've seen this again and again on the, on the iPad. You turn the iPad sideways, the thing turns sideways with you so that the top is the top. How does that happen behind the scenes? Well, since iOS 3, maybe since iOS 2, I don't go back that far, the way this has worked is the app didn't actually rotate. What rotated is a view of the app. And it did that by having a transform performed on it. Now, this could be very confusing for the program because it means that right and left now mean up and down. So at certain moments in the program, if you took a measurement to say, how wide is my view and how tall is my view, you'd have them backwards without realizing it, because the way rotation worked was to apply a transform to the view. In iOS 8, all of that comes to an end. In iOS 8, they say to themselves, what should really rotate here? The app should rotate, just like it looks like it's doing. And now the app rotates. The thing is never secretly sideways from itself. The app rotates. Up is always up. Right is always right. It always works. So all that happens is, as far as, the, uh, as far as the program is concerned, all that happens is my view is sometimes taller than it is wide and sometimes wider than it is tall. It changes its dimensions, but it doesn't change its transform. It's always upright because the app is always upright. The app has rotated within the device. Now, that may seem like a little thing to you, but believe me, you know, there's a thousand mistakes that you could make before in this regard. That's all going to come to an end in iOS 8. Now I'll give another example. This one's really compelling. Popovers. This is a, such a great example. What is a popover? It's that thing with a little arrow. It looks like a, on the iPad, it looks like a little window about the size and shape of an iPhone on an iPad with a little arrow pointing to the button that you tapped in order to make the thing appear. Can't have those on a on a on on an iPhone. So, so if you accidentally tried to run popover code on the iPhone, you would crash. 
can't make a popover on an iPhone. That's all over. Now, if you try to summon, if, if you have a popover on 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 uh, iPad, and you and you're running on an iPhone, and you call the code that summons the popover on the iPhone, you do not crash. The popover appears as a view over the view that you're already in. It, pre- it, it appears as what they call a modal view or a presented view. It just lays over top of everything. So there's no error. And there's no error. That means there's no if. See, my code used to be filled to write a universal app, an app that runs on both iPad and iPhone. I had to write all these ifs, right? If I happen to be on an iPad right now, then do this, 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 and summon, an I- uh, summon a popover. But if I happen to be running on an iPhone, then do this and this and this and summon a modal view. Now, I just say, summon the view, dude. And it magically appears as a popover if you're on an iPad and as a presented view if you're on an iPhone. And, and, wait, get this. And if you insist, I love this part. If you insist, you can have the popover look like a popover on an iPhone. So you're going to see littler popovers, little balloon things with little arrows, even on the iPhone. Because they've said, what the heck were we stuck? There was no reason why you couldn't have a popover. What were we thinking? And that's what I want Apple to do. I want Apple to say, what were we thinking? Right? Why did we have these restrictions? Why were we doing it this dumb way when we could have done it this, this smooth, easy way that just made everybody's life simpler? And that's what they've done. So, first of all, this means that there's going to be a more consistent appearance between iPhone and iPad? There certainly could be. There could be. I mean, you don't have to make your popovers on an iPhone look like popovers. So, you still could be in this world. They've they've tried to make it easier to do the two different things that they do, but with less code. So things that only happened on the iPhone, on the iPad before, like a popover or that split view thing, like in the mail app where you've got the column down one side and the mail body on the other side, that used to be illegal on the iPhone. Now the rule is, if you want that on the iPhone, you can have it. If you want to write a mail app that's got a little tiny column down one side and a little tiny message on the other side of the screen, both of them, you can have that. Or, or you can have the thing that, that Apple Mail already does, where on the iPad, it's the column and the, and the message. And on the iPhone, the column occupies the entire thing and you tap and the message slides in. You can have that on the phone, but it's the same code. You don't have to ask for two different interfaces. You don't have to ask, you don't have to say, if I'm here, do this. If I'm here, do that. You just say one thing and the right thing happens on both platforms. So it might not be that you'll get uniform, um, uh, uh, identical interfaces, though you can, but it will certainly be easier to write an app that runs on both. Okay, so, but I'm, I'm curious, and not that it's ever going to make any difference to me, but you say the right thing happens on the right device. Right. So is the program calling a different view or a, a different, I don't know what the proper term is, Matt, but um, I'll, I'll just go with view. In other words, if I, if I have that mail app on my iPhone uh, that, and, and the columns are going to be you know, this big, how does, it, how does it know that it shouldn't do that if I don't want it to? How's it going to know to go to the other view? So there are options. I mean, there's 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 choices that you get to make as you configure this thing. You know, you get you get to say things now. You have the freedom. You have the freedom to do it either way. So 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 what Apple has done is create a thing called. They've created a thing called size classes, all right? So, so the, the world that you are in is defined not in terms so much of what device you're on, but, but 
of what the size world is like. Okay, so so an iPad is big size in both directions. An iPhone is smaller size horizontally because it's little. And if you turn it on its side, now it's smaller size vertically as well. So what you do is when you set up that split view, you it, it wants to know what should I do in case of restricted size? And there's a setting. So one possible answer is just show me the two columns. And sure enough, you will now see the two columns. In fact, the way that you do this is you fool the thing into thinking the sizes are still big. Basically, what you do is you just say, you're not on smaller size. Pretend this iPhone is an iPad. And it just goes, okay. okay. But, if you don't, but if you don't do that, then it looks around itself and it sees, up. Oh, I'm, I'm in a smaller size world. I've got a, I've got a narrower width. And so then... If you don't stop it, it'll simply revert to, no, I'll show you one and then the other. But I won't show them both side by side. So I, I guess what I'm – I mean, it's, it, there's no way they would lose this. But I'm trying to understand um, an app like Downcast or Instacast, which have – which each have different interfaces. I mean – Basically the same interface, but different styles of interface for the larger screen of an iPad or the smaller screen of an iPhone. So you're still going to have those two views. Yeah. It's just going to know intelligently which one to use. But from what you're saying, if if I wanted to or if the developer wanted to give me the option of having the the iPad view on the iPhone, no matter how, how I mean, pathetically small it might be and might not be a, a good idea or good experience, but if they wanted to give me that option, I could have it? Uh, yes, in theory, in theory, um, absolutely. In theory, you could you could write an i an iPhone uh, interface that just looks like a tiny version of the iPad interface. Now, as you say, I don't think people are going to do that because because Apple has done another thing, which is to make it easier to dictate what should change between the two platforms. Um. You can actually draw. See, it used to be if you wanted two different interfaces, you had to include two different interface files. Now you include one interface file, and basically that one interface file has conditions. So it says, well, you know, on a big screen, on an iPad, make this button really big and have it be located here. But on a smaller screen, make the button small and have it be located here. And all this is happening inside one interface file. So I think actually what's going to happen is you're going to continue to see um, a different interface on the, on, the, on the iPhone versus the iPad, and people are going to have an easier time um, writing those differences. Again, this was, a place, this was a place where it was easy to make a mistake, and they're trying to make it harder to make mistakes. They're trying to make it, they're trying to make it simpler. They're trying to take away all that, all, that, all that difference that you used to have. It was like writing two different programs all wrapped up in one program. It was maddening. And now they're trying to make it easier to just have your one program feel like one program. Will this mean that universal apps become f smaller size-wise for, 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 for downloading purposes, I'm asking? I don't think it's going to make a noticeable difference. If anything's going to happen with iOS 8, all apps are going to become bigger. Why? Because Swift is included in the program. So Swift adds five to eight um, megabytes of size to every program that, that, that uses Swift. Whoa. So if anything, if anything, all apps are going to get a little bit bigger. Okay, now wait a minute. You, you need to explain that. And, and I'm, I've, for someone that carries, and I know that there are a lot of you out there, folks, who carry a whole lot of apps around, if every app gets five to eight megs larger, I mean, that can affect how many apps you can have, and it might affect your judgment on – what size iPhone or iPad you buy? Or am I just, am I going over the deep end? I don't think you're going over the deep end. I mean, remember, Apple is a company that assumes, I mean, come on, you know, if you want Yosemite or Mavericks or whatever, you have to download, you know, four gigabytes worth of, of operating system. So Apple is already in a world that assumes you've got great bandwidth and that you really don't care that you have to, to download very large objects. 
You know, they've got look at the way they're they're look at the way Apple's own applications work. They're already assuming you've got a gigantic screen. You know, so Apple is already assuming you've got a really fast computer. You know, I bought a fast computer. I I've been working for like five years on the same Mac Mini. So it's like it was you know it was five years old, and I finally sort of broke down and said, all right, all right. You know, I'm breaking down. I'm going to get a new a new Mac Mini. It was not new. It's it, they haven't made a new one since 2012. But the point is, it was a quad core. It's a quad core. You know, Intel machines. Like whoa. You know, and all of a sudden, I'm like, this explains everything. <laughs> I thought Apple was writing these really slow apps. Now it turns out they're just using a faster computer than I. So Apple always assumes you've got the latest and greatest because everybody at Apple has the latest and greatest. They're not using any slow things. They're not using any things that have like, you know, 16 gigabytes of RAM. They, come on. They've all got the fastest, biggest thing. So they're assuming you've got the fastest, biggest thing. So that's right. You're going to notice this difference. You, if you are someone who's trying to stick with, a, with an older device and it's only got so much room and you download the new swiftified version of something it's going to take five to it's going to, it's going to be bigger than it was because swift comes with it why why does swift come with it because because otherwise it wouldn't be backwards compatible swift has to be able to run on ios 7 how's that going to be possible ios 7 doesn't have swift in it swift wasn't invented Therefore, in order to make that happen, they have to include the entire Swift language, a whole Swift language library, inside the app itself. And so when the app actually runs, the app's Swift is translated by the app itself into um, Objective-C in order to talk to iOS 7. That's how Swift works. So I'm just sitting here looking at the, the number of apps on my home screen. <laughs> and... <laughs> I mean, you know, again, I, I don't know if that's if that's a huge deal, and but it you start multiplying it. Let's see how many apps on a screen times how many screens do you have? You suddenly are into a a bit more storage space just for the apps, let alone you know anything else that you create like photos or video or whatever. So so, so help me out with this, Matt. I want to make sure we get it right for the folks. They're going to take up more room. Mm. Does that does the fact that they take up more room have anything to do with how how quickly they ask, uh, execute, or is that it, does that library sit there and just never gets accessed? Well, it's accessed because it's what translate. If someone writes an app in Swift, something has to translate from from Swift to Objective C in order to talk to the the operating system. So, but I don't think it's got anything to do with speed. I really don't want to make any predictions about whether Swift apps are going to be faster. Um, they said a lot of stuff about Swift being fast in their, in, their, in their announcements, but we shall see. I certainly have encountered uh, test cases where Swift was prohibitively slow. In other words, I, I had the same code. I was doing the same, uh, I was doing the same behavior. I was doing the same uh, functionality. And I had a version written in, in Objective C and a version written in, in in Swift, but they were line by line. I was doing exactly the same thing, and the Swift version was so slow you'd never ever release that app, or at least if you released that app, you wouldn't use Swift for that part of it. Remember that that a mixed apps are always part possible. So if you come to a section of code where you're like, no, I can't release this in Swift; it's just not working fast enough, then you won't. You'll release that part in Objective C. I mean, the user will never know. So you're going to be using hybrid apps. You're not even going to be aware of that. No, the only thing you're going to know is is that that I mean, look, this is not going to make a difference to you if this was a 40 megabyte app. Now it's a 45 megabyte app. What do you care? See, it's not that big a difference percentage wise. But if this was a two megabyte app and it's gone to being a seven megabyte app, yeah, that seems like a big change. It seems like a big change, but I don't care if it was a, a 40 megabyte app that went to 45. If I have 25 of them. Then, you know, it starts to. I mean, it just starts to add up. It's like raindrops. It does, it does. It does start to add up. But come on, you've probably got you've probably got several gigabytes free on your device, right? Well, it takes a load of megabytes to make a gigabyte. I mean, a thousand to be precise. Yeah. So, so let's say, let's say, you know, let's say you got five of these things. You know, I mean, it's going to be two hundred apps before you before you take up an extra gigabyte. I haven't got 200 apps on my iPhone. 
and I've got, you know, I've got three gigabytes of space free. Maybe you do have 200. And you're looking at me like you might have 200. <laughs> oh. giving me that, you're giving me that. I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not, not sure I use them all, but I, I got a bunch on here. I'll have to count and then, and then do some calculations. Seriously, though, that, you know, that can have an effect on if, if you're out there looking to buy the next iPhone or the next iPad or whatever we're going to see released later this year. Uh, you may want to think about net just buying the, the, the bottom of, not the bottom of the barrel, sorry, but the, the, the low end model. You may want to kick up a, a notch. All right, but there's another possibility. It occurs to me that maybe what I'm saying won't be true. I mean, maybe what I'm seeing, I, I can only tell you what's happening now, you know, so maybe That's what true. I'm seeing is an intermediate phase. And maybe what's going to happen is they'll, they'll figure out a way to, to, to install those libraries because those libraries are the same for every single Swift app. So maybe what's going to happen is they'll find a way to install that library in some dynamic way into iOS 7. And now the problem goes away. Now every app doesn't include Swift. So maybe everything I just said is will be false. But right now, that's the way Swift works. And it's ingenious because it, because it means that, that I can run... I mean, I have written, just as an experiment... I wrote a version of one of my apps, completely rewrote it in Swift, and stuck it onto my iPhone, which is not my development iPhone. I'm still running, you know, iOS 7.1.2 or whatever the, the current version, and it runs just fine. You know, and it's like, this is great. I mean, to me, that's fantastic. The fact that it's a little larger didn't seem bad to me, the, because, because it meant you know, I was able to... to to really rewrite this app in a cool, powerful way, and it runs. Well, if, if that's a trade-off to get a little more backwards compatibility, to have older devices a little more compatible, that's it. Without hamstringing the the new the newest hardware, I mean, because for a while that was you know that was a big selling point of a Mac is that the software would run you know back 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 back. Well, Apple finally got over that, and I. You know, I think it's it's a double edged sword, but I think overall it's good because we all demand more performance now, and so yeah, it, it might cost you some space on an iPhone or an iOS seven device, but it sounds like the compatibility will be there with the with a lot of the latest and greatest apps. That's right, and 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 I think there's a lot of, I mean, I mean they've done a lot of. Um, well, I shouldn't go too far. There will be things in iOS 8, as usual, that are going to make people want to upgrade to iOS 8. You know, I don't, I'm not a big backwards compatibility person. I, I, I can't be. It's too hard. I've said this again and again. When, when Apple releases a new version, a major new version of their operating system, what I personally do, now, I, w I might not do this if I was a big development house. You know, if I was Candy Crush or something, I would have to think about backwards compatibility. But I'm not Candy Crush. All my apps are free, and the ones that aren't free are a dollar, and I make, you know, I'm lucky if I make $50 a year. This is not a money-making concern. This is a maintenance concern. So what I do is give up, right? When iOS, <laughs> when iOS 8 comes out, I will rewrite my apps. I've, in fact, I've already rewritten them. I'm just waiting for iOS 8 to be finished so I can release them. I'll rewrite my apps in iOS 8, and they will thenceforth be iOS 8 only. If you want the new features, you must upgrade to iOS 8. That's my attitude. My attitude is I don't care about backwards compatibility. You want to stay back at iOS 7? Too bad for you. You can't run this app. You can't run a newer version of this app. Now, the, luckily, the App Store allows you to download older versions. So if a guy writes me and says, I'm still back at iOS 5, I'm like, I can't send you an iOS 5 compatible version of, of this app, but the store should give it to you. If you go on the app store, it knows what you're using. You can have the older version. So you won't have the latest and greatest features, but you can have the app. I think that's a pretty good compromise. Yeah. But as a developer, but like I say, as a developer, I just I don't try to be backwards compatible. It's too hard. It's too hard because now you have all those if statements again. You're like, if I turn out to, you know, the, the program has to look around itself and say, what environment am I in? If I'm on iOS 7, do this. If I'm on iOS 8, do this. God forbid you should use any iOS 8 worlds while you're on iOS 7. You will crash. See what I'm saying? It's a big risk. It's scary. And it's hard to test. You know, it's hard to know you've got every single base cover that you haven't accidentally uttered any iOS 8 words when you're in iOS 7. 
and you make that mistake and you're going to crash. That's not, to me, that's not worth it. It's not worth worrying about the user experience. I want to be able to offer what's, look, look at the stuff that I just said about, about popovers, you know. I mean, here they've gone to all this trouble to allow me to, to just summon the popover and the right thing will happen on the iPad, the right thing will happen on the iPhone. This is so much easier. I never want to go back to the old code. The old way of managing popovers was horrible. I banged my head against it every day. I'd rather do anything than even use a popover. It was hard to use popovers just as popovers, let alone have something that worked on both iPad and iPhone. Now all of that is gone. Now it's totally easy. You think I ever want to say any of that stuff again? No, I don't. I never want to code like I had to in iOS 4 five, six, and seven. So I'm never going to. To wrap this up. <laughs> I, I, did, I, did, I, did I get into a little rant there? No, that's... <laughs> you have a way of bringing this out in me, Chuck. <laughs> well, that's one of my talents. It is. Uh, I've, I've got to figure out... I've got to figure out a way to cash, cash in on it. Ah, but, yes. No. God, it's like the Jerry Springer show yeah. around here. <laughs> We don't have any bouncers, Matt. <laughs> it, is it fair to say this is uh, this is you're looking? I, well, I know you're looking forward to iOS eight for the reasons you've said, but is this a, a, a major? I mean, this feels like a major step forward. It feels like, I mean, uh, okay, every version of iOS, you know, is is promoted with this great feature, that great feature, this new thing, this that that new thing. This one though feels like it's a bit more of a quantum leap ahead. That this really sets us as a basis for where we need to go for the next X number of years. Am yes, I, I think that's true. Okay. I think that's true. Okay. Yes. Um, it's a quantum leap ahead in a way that may not feel, I don't know, we, sh we should talk again after you've got all iOS 8 and you've got new iOS 8 versions of your apps and see whether you think there's some big difference. But you see, I think it's a quantum leap ahead for developers. I think, I mean, they've done, they've done, They've, they've rational, you know, we had this conversation, you know, last year, you know, what do we need in the next version of iOS? And, and, and you know, we, we listed some things that they needed to do. They need to stop. They need to rationalize what they're doing. They need to, they need to, um, here's one of the things that we said. Um, they, they, there needs to be a standard way to have a kind of file system-like thing on iOS. This business where every app just kind of shelters its own documents and you can't share them out, this has got to go. They're doing that. So this has been, it, this, this to me, iOS 8 is all about the rationalization. They've rationalized the language. They've rationalized the business of having multiple size devices. All of that is going to allow them to move forward on this platform in a continued, in, instead of continuing to glom things on and, you know, just grow in this accretive way, I think they can now grow in an intelligent, sensible way. So, yes, in that sense, I think this has been a, this is a, this is a quantum leap. They, it, but in some ways, it's a quantum leap backwards. It's like they've gone back and said, wait, where did we go wrong? Well, it was somewhere around iOS 4. You know, we really blew it back then. Let's just stop doing all the stuff we've been doing wrong ever since then, ever since the first universal apps, ever since, you know, let's just go back and take a look around ourselves and ask ourselves, you know, can we do this more sensibly? And they can, and they are. Now, it's going to be really interesting to see what the announcement is on, on the new devices. Because, you see, one of the things that this new, this new way of looking at size enables is... I don't really need to know what kind of device I'm on. So we could have a sort of pseudo tablety device or something. I don't know. You know, we could have some intermediate size. So oh, we'll what? see what we'll see what the what the iPhone 6 looks like. But the thing is, it's not going to be hard to make using iOS 8, no matter how strange the iPhone 6 is, you know, it could be shaped like a circle. I don't care. It could be shaped like a dodec. Well, okay, that would be confusing. But the point is, it could be some. It could be some different size ratio. See what I'm saying? And that's not going to stop me from being able to write my app so that it runs on it, because I'm no longer thinking in terms of fixed dimensions. I'm thinking in terms of these generalized size classes. So iPad, iPhone, anything in between. I don't care anymore. That's an example of how they've laid the basis for going forward. Last last question because I did want to ask this and, and make clear: When I get iOS eight, 
am I going to know that a given app is written in Swift or is it going to be completely transparent? Okay. No, you're not going to have the slightest way of knowing. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Swift is merely a way for the developer, the author of the program, to put words on paper, screen, that, that, that when compiled will speak to the system. Either way, they translate into the same thing ultimately. They, they translate into commands to the system. There'll be nothing about it that will tell you. And if they take away the size thing that I was talking about before, if, if, if that's no longer there as a clue, you'll really have no clue. Hmm. Matt, you, it's always fascinating to talk to you because I know you think that you go a little crazy and geeky. <laughs> and in places maybe you do, but you, al you always pull it back so that we can kind of understand it. And I think it's, I think it's great to give people a little bit of a look into the developer's world and, and what's going on back there because, you know, we're, we're always looking for the cool new app and you don't always appreciate just what it takes to create that. So thank you. Well, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk about this stuff. I mean, I, you know, this is what I live and breathe, so... It's no great kidding. to get some of this. It's great to get some of this <laughs> off my chest. Well, well, we'll see you again soon for another therapy session. How's that? Okay, that'll be good. I, I think I need it. <laughs> it's great to talk to you. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you after iOS eight comes out, and we'll do a little uh, debriefing then. Good. I great. look forward to that. Folks, he's Matt Newberg. Check the uh, the, the uh, show notes. I will have links to everything that Matt wants to tell you about himself there. Um, and of course, come back and see us here again on Mac Voices. As always, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at MacVoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at BackbeatMedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at Cashfly.com. <laughs>